about that? How about that? How many of you, looking at that, you're like, man, that looks horrifying. Never, ever in a million years, ever. Like, you're afraid of heights. And how many of you are like, that looks fun. Let's do that after church. <laughs> Y'all are sick. You need help, especially you. Yeah, looking at you, Bill. Jeez. Hey, um, listen, before we go any further with the service today, a uh, very special note today. We have flowers here on the stage because today is a very special birthday. Where's Bob Benson? Where is he at? Where's Bob? Where's Bob? Guys, this one of the most faithful, this one of the most faithful servants in our church has been coming to our church for a long time and generations of his family come. It is Bob's 90th birthday today. <laughs> Happy birthday, Bob. We love you, man. Happy birthday. Oh, man, so good. Well, I am um, thrilled to be here with everybody here today. Uh, man, I don't even know what to say to what uh, Billy was saying just then and, and all you guys. I just love you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm a little, I talk for a living when I'm speechless. You know that? <laughs> that messes with you. Um, so, yeah, it was a big weekend in my life uh, and in the life of our church this past weekend. Uh, like Billy said, I got ordained as a full elder in the United Methodist Church. That's a long, long journey. That was very cool. So, truth be told, I didn't know Billy was going to show pictures. He did this the last service. I had pictures to show you guys. So I'll blow through these. Can I, can I still show them to you? Is that okay? All right. Okay, so here's a picture of uh, the actual service yesterday. There was probably a couple thousand people there. And that's the Bishop of Florida, the guy in the white. And he's laying hands on me. And it's a tradition for Christ followers everywhere in every tradition that when somebody's made an elder, that they need the laying on the hands of the bishop or the elders. And uh, they gave me a certificate to show the lineage of who laid hands on me. That's Bishop Ken Carter and who laid hands on him and who laid hands on them going all the way back to the people that John Wesley sent to America in the 1700s. So um, it was a quite an honor. And so that's our district superintendent uh, laying hands on me and the two people um, on the far right, Dale is behind the other guy, but those are some very important people in my life. Go to the next slide. This is uh, Pastor Dale. Obviously, everyone knows him on the right, and on the left is my senior pastor. Yeah, would you guys are like, why are you and Dale in dresses? I don't understand. <laughs> it's a little bit more traditional setting in services like this. You know, I don't wear denim all the time in church. And, um, and so the guy on the left is the senior pastor of my home church. He's retired now, but he's the pastor I grew up with in the church as a little boy. And his name's Reverend David Landers. And to see the two of them meet each other and then lay hands on me was an emotional moment for me. I got a little choked up. I just snorted. And that just happened. <laughs> so uh, that, was, uh, that, was quite, that was quite a big deal. Quite a big deal for me. And can I just t say, um, you guys can go and take that picture off. Uh, can I just say that uh, my thought with God yesterday, so I wanted to make sure I was in the moment fully. When you have a big moment in life, you want to make sure you're fully there, right? Yeah. So I took time to be alone with God yesterday morning, and I felt like the thing and my time being alone in prayer with God that God was bringing back to my heart was the day I got ordained. I mean, true, it needs the affirmation of the community uh, and, you know, testing and, you know, all that stuff that they did to make sure that, you know, they want, I'm a trustworthy person, hopefully. <laughs> um, but was, God actually called me when I was in seventh grade. Where's my Kids of Hope volunteers? Where are you at? Raise your hands. So I got called when I was in seventh grade to ministry because a Kids of Hope volunteer, my Sunday school teacher, it was like Kids of Hope, gave me a CD of some music and I opened up, and she just gave it to me for my birthday because she loved me and was investing in my life. She bought it with her own money and just gave it to me because she cared about me. And I was listening to it. I took the CD out and put it in the three CD changer I had in my room back in 1996, you know. You know? <laughs> and uh, I was reading the lyrics of this song. And to my seventh grader heart, I must have been 12 or 13 years old, whatever, uh, the Holy Spirit whispered to me and said, this is what you, I want you to do with your life. It scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> and so here's, here's my thought. When God is looking for people to impact the world, not just be ordained, but all, any of us, all of us, God is always on the lookout for people he can use to change the world. Amen? Amen. When he's looking for people to make a difference in the world for the name of Jesus. 
God doesn't go to the rich or the powerful or the highly esteemed. God picked a middle schooler. And God picks you. So first off, if there are any students here, where's Via Sun students? Where you at? Where you at? A couple of you guys. Okay, someone, they're all like, what is he about to say? <laughs> <laughs> um, keep an open ear. God wants to use you. It's in lots of different ways. God uses people more than just people on a stage with a microphone. That's just one part of how God uses people in his kingdom. Amen? Just one small part. But listen for him. He wants to use you. And for all of us here too, God wants to use you. And that's a lot of what we're talking about in this series that we're going to get to here in just a minute. So here's the thought. God wants to use everybody. And here's the second thing. What type of a God do we worship when he wants to raise people up to make a difference that he picks children first? I, that's the kind of God I want to worship. Amen? It, may, it makes no sense, but that's what makes it beautiful. So I just love that about him. So it's also been a historic weekend for our church in another way. Our lead pastor, Pastor Dale, as you saw in the picture there, uh, he is preaching at our East Campus here today. He was preached here last night on Saturday night, but he's there at the East Campus this week, and it's a really cool thing. This week marks the one-year anniversary of us officially bringing on the East Campus and launching it. So isn't that cool? And yeah, so here's some faithful people in the church. Let's just keep going through these. Just keep going through. This is Easter this past year. I didn't pick that picture. Somebody else did. Nice beard, though. No, it's just more you know, pictures of people walking in. That's actually my little girl there. How about that? And then here's a picture of the building. Looks great from what it was before to what it is now. It's absolutely gorgeous. How many of you have not yet been to the East Campus? Um, you should go check it out. It's great. The services are the exact same. The message is the exact same regardless of who the preacher is there. And um, so you should check it out. For some people, it might actually be geographically closer if you're making a big trek all the way out here. If you live closer in West Palm Beach, go check it out. It's on South Military Drive. It's a great thing. So one year in. Not bad, huh? Yeah, very good. Very good. So... Now, enough about all that stuff. We're talking about bless this mess. Everyone say that with me. Bless this mess. Now, something that we do in every sermon series that we're doing, it's an experiment we're trying in 2018. We try to memorize a passage of scripture in each one. So go ahead and pull out these cards. Then your connect folder that you're handed on your way in. Go ahead and pull them out. Hold them up. Let me see. Hold up your little card. Let me see. Very good. Very good. If you're streaming with us online, we have a solution for you too. If you come in person, you get a memory card. Somebody told me in the last service, they said, Pastor Trevor, come here. And they opened up their glasses case and they had all the memory cards in there from the year so far. So however you do this, hold on to these to memorize these scriptures. It's good for you spiritually, not just to read the Bible, but to memorize the Bible. It does things for your soul that just reading it won't do. It's powerful. If you're streaming online, you can go on the front page of our website, click on current series, and you can download a graphic to put in the background of your smartphone. That's how I memorize it particularly. I always have my lock screen is always the memory verse here. So memorize it, check it out, and especially if you can't find any of that stuff, you don't go to the website, it's all on Facebook in a photo album, so you can find that too. And everyone's like, what's that snap face thing? I don't like that social media. <laughs> Whatever, half of you got the joke I was just saying there. Nonetheless, so here, here's the deal. Here's the passage of scripture. It's actually our memory verse for the series, and it's also the passage for today. So we're going to dive deep on these two verses here. It's Ephesians chapter 5, 15 through 16. It's on the screen. Let's read it out loud together. Ready? Go. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Wow, why in the world are we making you memorize that? You're about to find out. You're about to find out. So we're talking about bless this mess. Let's say a quick prayer before we dive in. Let's pray. Lord, here's my simple prayer. Your, psalm, your psalmist says, uh, a cry to you to, Lord, open our eyes that we would see wonderful things in your law. And that's what I'm asking for now. Lord, no one came here to hear good talk. We all came here to hear from you and your word. So come, Holy Spirit. Lord, you're already here. We acknowledge your presence. But would you do this work of grace in our lives? Open our eyes, our hearts, our ears to hear what you're saying to each of us in the particular application for every life in this room and streaming online who may download this later. 
do it, Lord, we pray in your name. And everybody said, amen. All right, so let me set up where we'd like to go in this sermon series without letting the cat out of the bag entirely. So today is all we're just trying to set the table for where we're going in this series. Now, both Pastor Dale and I, were in a lot of different conversations and a lot of different environments where everyone seems to be talking about how things in our world are not working well. By the way, have you noticed that? Things aren't working well, right? Yeah, it's a little cray cray right now. Uh, it's a little nuts. Yeah, in fact, many, uh, some people who are sociologists say that uh, they're looking at our society, particularly in America and in the Western world right now, that our society seems to be going through a season of autocorrect in a lot of different areas. And that this happens, you could trace it all throughout human history. There's times where societies and cultures go through massive seasons of change where there's seismic shifts in what's happening. And we believe that's happening right now. For instance, that's happening definitely in government. Now, don't worry, I'm not going all Republican or Democrat on anybody. We think those are non-essential issues for the kingdom of God. We don't, we're not a blue church, we're not a red church, we're a Jesus church, amen? Amen, amen for crying out loud, amen, jeez. <laughs> Nonetheless, um, in politics and in government, there's big seismic shifts that are happening because of the 2016 election, where on both parties, red and blue, there's seismic shifts with the rise of the populist movement and many different candidates. Things are shifting in government. Things are shifting in society with values. Things are shifting in families and family values. Things are shifting in education. Good Lord, if you want to start a fight, bring up your philosophy of how to do schools. Good grief. Things are shifting in national and international relations. Big deals this week with our country being represented at the G7 summits and with the summit that's happening uh, in Singapore with North Korea, which, by the way, pray for that summit this week. Amen? Prayers matter. We should pray for that. Things are happening. If you read the news or if you read the newspaper, which newspapers are these things that were paper that fold, and it's when news was put on paper before... <laughs> Um, so if you just keep up with the news, you could see this, that, wow, there's a lot going on. There's even a lot going on in religious circles and in denominational circles. Pastor Dale and I were in denominational meetings all week long, and our particular tradition is in deep crisis. Big problems are going on. There's a lot of arguing about stuff and fretting about stuff and anxiety about stuff. And Oh, just Dale and I are sick of it. We're happy to be back here with you guys, or at least you all seem half sane. So that's, you know... <laughs> So that's good. So it's happening everywhere, but it's not just all these big spheres of life and, you know, where we're sitting in ivory towers contemplating what's going on in government, politics, and religion, and society, but it's happening in your lives. See, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I should own stock in Starbucks because I'm there a lot with you guys. I drink my blonde roast a lot. I love that stuff, by the way. I'm not a Dunkin' Donuts person. Nonetheless, oh, I shouldn't have said that. How many of you did I just hurt your feelings? No. And all the way in the back. I, I drink Dunkin' Donuts. I just like to write blah, blah, blah. Squirrel! Okay, I'm back. <laughs> so, but I know from talking to all of you, the, our lives don't always go right. Like, there's messes in our society, and there's messes all in this room and streaming online. You got relationship issues. You've got health crises. You're in seasons of change, painful transitions. There is stuff going on. If there's a mess all around us, there can also be a mess going on in you and around you and in your life. And I know it because I talk to you and I'm your pastor. We're talking about the messes in this sermon series. We're talking about messes in this sermon series. Now, nobody likes a whiner, so we didn't come here to whine about it. That's not what we're going to do. We're like, oh, but things are hard. All right, amen, let's go home. Yeah. We're not doing that. We're here to have a conversation about it. And what does God say about the messes in our world and in our lives? So here's how we want to begin to frame it. There's a Christian um, philosopher by the name of, this name's funny, Robert Roberts. Isn't that funny? Hi, my name is Trevor Treverson. You know? <laughs> so his name is Robert Roberts, and he wrote this book called Spiritual Emotions, The Psychology of Christian Virtues. And he says that there are typically three ways that most of us respond to challenging, adversarial, or change-oriented times. So when we're in tough times and when there's a mess, 
there's three responses that most people have. Here's the first one. If you haven't started taking notes yet, you better start now. Start taking notes. Here's the first one. The first response is despair, is despair. Robert Roberts defines despair as this. He says, despair is when our longing for whatever is in focus is still strong, like we want something and we still desire it, but you believe it won't happen. In other words, we believe our longing will go unfulfilled. And then because of this, the thought of the future becomes painful to us. When people are stuck in despair, they end up saying things like, man, this depression I'm facing is not going to get any better. They end up saying things like, I'll never be loved, or I can't make any difference in this situation. Despair paralyzes us. Despair makes us wall off from the rest of the world. Despair, if I was going to just summarize it into one statement, here's how I think about it. Despair is when we say to ourselves, it will never happen. It will never happen. And when we do this, it makes our soul sick. Despair makes the human soul sick. For instance, we saw, um, again, if you just keep up with the news at all, in any platform whatsoever, we had two very high-profile suicides in this country this past week. Or maybe not in this country, but in our society, nonetheless. Here's the first one. Um, fashion designer Kate Spade took her life after battling with depression. How many of you know this guy, Anthony Bourdain? CNN took his life. How many of you used to watch his shows? Yeah. These people seem like they had it all. They had fame and success and money. And, but gosh, there's epidemic levels of despair in our society today. Now, there, we care about this in our church. In fact, the last all-staff meeting that we had where every staff member, full-time, part-time, on both campuses, all met here. We believe in it so much. We had our director of pastoral care, Jeff McIntosh, which, by the way, who loves Jeff McIntosh? Isn't he great? Love that guy. He's awesome. He taught our staff a session, a whole 45 minutes on suicide prevention because it's epidemic levels of despair in our society now. Now, you might be somebody who go, Pastor Trevor, I don't necessarily struggle with suicidal thoughts. I'm like, that's okay. That's despair bottomed out. But you could still struggle with despair when there's something that you want, but your inner dialogue is, it will never happen. It makes the soul sick. And Robert Roberts says, Dis, uh, the human soul, if it's in despair too long, it gets ill and it gets diseased because the human soul was never, ever meant to cope with despair. It's a symptom of a broken and fallen world and broken and fallen people. God didn't make the world this way. We broke it and now it's this way. And so we respond to the mess with first despair. Here's another response. It's different from despair. Another way people can respond to the messes of our lives is resignation. Resignation. And this is where it's kind of the halfway between despair and our third option that we're going to talk about. Resignation is where we ratchet down our desire for what we want. We convince ourselves that what we want so badly actually isn't a big deal after all. So if despair is, it will never happen. Resignation is... It doesn't really matter anyway. That job I wanted, it wasn't that great anyway. And she, she's not actually that cute. He's actually not all that in a bag of chips. It's where we minimize what we want and we lie to ourselves and we rationalize things away and we push it down and we turn the volume down on what we want because it hurts too bad to have that desire still. You with me? So people just become resigned. Despair, it will never happen. Resignation, didn't even really matter in the first place. But Robert Roberts says, when we come to the messes in our lives, there's despair, resignation, but then there's a third option that people can have, and it's hope. We're partial to this idea at our church, if you haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> hope 
is the belief that the future holds good things. Of course, hope requires waiting, and hope can have uncertainty in it, which is scary. But when we hope, we delight in the future. We can welcome tomorrow and see within hopeful opportunity to make a difference. Uh, pastor Dale, he's the lead pastor, founding pastor of our church. God told him to name our church Community of Hope. It's an awesome story. You should hear it sometime. I'm not going to tell it now. But this idea to call a church hope is powerful. So because of that, Dale's the founder and leader of our church. I kind of consider him the resident expert on hope in our church. And here's what he says about hope. Hope is the belief that tomorrow can be better than yesterday. It's powerful. Now, here's what's really unique, and I want you to key in here. This is all foundational stuff we're laying for where this series is going. It's the intellectual um, thought process that makes it all click together. The type of hope that Christ followers have is way different than wishful thinking. The type of hope that Christ followers has isn't when you wish upon a star all your dreams come true, even though I have nothing against Disney World. It's different. It's different. And so if you're here today and you're new to church or you don't identify yet as a follower of Christ, I want you to listen very carefully to me. The hope that Christians have is far more certain and powerful and life-changing and world-changing than just wishful thinking and the power of positive thinking. It's not that. It's deeper. In fact, the Apostle Peter writes about this in his uh, letter in the New Testament. He says this in 1 Peter 1, 3. It's going to be on the screen. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. Wow. Into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Here's what that means. When Jesus was crucified on Good Friday, the Roman centurions who were there who executed him as a criminal of the state, they made sure he was dead. If anybody ever told you Jesus was just in a coma, they're lying. Roman soldiers knew how to kill people, and they knew, people when, they knew when people were dead or not. They were really good at it. He was dead, and they put him in a tomb and rolled a stone over it, and everything was over, and all hope was lost, and some of the disciples went into despair, and someone went into resignation, and then Saturday came, and then Sunday came, and God the Father sent God the Holy Spirit into that tomb and breathed over the corpse of Jesus Christ and breathed his spirit back into his body, and Jesus was not resuscitated. He was resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit. He stood up in that grave, life full in his body, physically, literally resurrected, spoke to that rock, it rolled away, and he walked out of that tomb forevermore, alive, defeating death once and for all. Now, and here's why it matters. Because of the resurrection, living hope means this. When there's a stone rolled over a tomb in your life, and a mess looks like nothing but death and there's no hope, now the truth is that because Jesus has defeated death, Death no longer has the last say. Nothing has the last say. Jesus has the last say on everything forevermore. So when life and your messes have told you to despair or just resign and say, this is over, put a period, it's dead. Jesus comes and says, erase that period, put a comma, because I'm not done yet. Amen? Amen. Say that with me. This is what hope means. God's not done yet. Say it with me. God's not done yet. He's not done yet. And that changes things when there's a mess in your life or there's a mess in our society. And you can despair and say, it will never happen. And you can be resigned and say, I never cared about it in the first place. Or you can have Christian hope and saying, it looks bad, and there's a stone over there now, but I know the truth that God's not done yet. It's living hope. 
Now, what in the world does this have to do with Ephesians? And what in the world am I talking about with Bless the Mess? We're going to put it all together right now. So in this passage, what the Apostle Paul is doing in the book of Ephesians, it's quite powerful. Paul wrote this to them in 62 AD. Paul was in prison in 62 AD. He had helped start these churches in Ephesus. These people who were once far from God, Paul helped them find hope in Christ. And he brought hope to them. He changed everything. In Ephesians, most of the letters of the New Testament are around a particular issue. Like 1 Corinthians is Christians gone wild and Paul is cleaning up an awful mess. In Ephesians, there's nothing like that. All Paul wants to talk about is how Jesus has reconciled the world to God and that the world can have hope. That's all he wants to talk about and he wants to remind them about. And he's reminding them that because he built a bridge to them, that it's their job now to build a bridge to other people to find hope. In fact, there's another great story about building bridges that we just love. It's this picture here. Who knows where this is? Picture of Niagara Falls. I gave it away. <laughs> Who knows where it is? This is Niagara Falls. And the man on the right is a man named Charles Ellett. Charles Ellett was the first person who built a suspension bridge over Niagara Falls. It's a fascinating story. Now, Niagara Falls, it's 825 feet across. It's 200 feet straight down. And every minute, 37.4 million gallons of water fall into the abyss. And you thought it cost a lot to fill your pool. Man, <laughs> it's amazing. This amazing feat of engineering that he did to build a bridge. It's powerful. How do you even begin to do something like this? Well, he created a contest for a boy to fly a kite from the American side to the Canadian side. And the first boy who was able to fly a kite across to do that would get $5. And the first boy to do it was a boy named Homer Walsh. Wow, that's a name. And uh, what they would do, they would fly the kite to one side and they would attach a wire to the string and then they'd fly the kite back to the other side. And they would take the wire. And then they would do it back and forth, back and forth until they had a couple wires across Niagara Falls. It's the beginning of a bridge. And then after they had enough wires, Charles Ellett built a contraption to go over this larger wire that they had built to begin building the suspension bridge. That's why we had the picture of the guys walking on the tight ropes, just to get the picture in your mind of what they had to do to build this bridge so other people could cross it. Why am I telling you all this? Let's rewind. In Ephesians, Paul's writing to them. He brought the hope of Christ to them. He's reminding them, now it's your job to bring hope to people who can't find hope. And the Ephesian church did. And he's writing to us today. We might not be living in Asia Minor in 62 AD, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, God is speaking to each and every single one of us. And he's saying, your world needs hope. Will you help me build a bridge to those who can't find it. God wants to use you. Now, how do we do this? It's just in that memory verse. It's three little phrases that we're going to look at in these last five minutes. It's got all tied together. So here it is. The first phrase in our memory verse is, be careful how you live. Be very careful how you live. It's interesting here in the Greek, the word for live isn't live, it, it's literally walk. So if you just read it in the plain Greek in the original language, Paul's saying, be careful how you walk. Now, is he talking literally, don't trip in the woods? Is that what he's saying? No, it's a metaphor to help you understand what the faith journey is. If somebody ever told you that following Jesus is a way to get your ticket to heaven when you die, that's not it. That's part of it that's wonderful, but it is way more. It's a journey that you should pay attention to. In fact, uh, 
we all celebrated and honored the life of Billy Graham here the past several months, the great Billy Graham, the evangelist who died just a few weeks ago. Here's a picture of him and his beloved wife, Ruth Graham, wonderful woman. Uh, P- Billy Graham had this worldwide ministry, and she was there taking care of their family and raising their kids. And gosh, it's just an incredible feat, right? What an amazing woman. In fact, a reporter came to Ruth Graham one day and said, gosh, with Billy all over the world, I can't imagine he's hardly home at all. Have you ever thought about divorce? And she looked at the reporter and said, divorce? No. Murder? All the time. <laughs> yeah, but Ruth Graham Bell understood her journey of faith, of following Jesus, not a punch card, but following Jesus as construction, that she was this construction project, that she was on a journey. And here's a picture of her headstone. And Billy is now buried next to her. But this is what she wanted on her headstone. End of construction. Thank you for your patience. Wow, right? Be very careful how you walk. It's a journey. And friends, let me tell you, if you think of following Jesus as a walk, you're going to pay attention to your surroundings of where you're walking, are you not? Okay, follow me. The next phrase, that is not as unwise, but as wise. So if you're walking and you're paying attention and saying, be wise, what's saying is notice what's going on around you. Walk in wisdom, learn to think the way God thinks about your life around you. Be very careful then how you live, not as wise, but as, not as unwise, but as wise. I need to work on my memory game. But here's the phrase that's the kicker, and here's where I want to land the sermon. It's the setup for everything we're going to talk about over the next several weeks. It says this, make the most of every opportunity, for the days are evil. They were living in evil times. And so are we. And there's a lot of messes in the world, is there not? There's a lot of messes that walked in here. A lot of messes that you have going around in your life and in your heart. Now notice what Paul says. He says the days are evil. But does he go into despair? He says, well, it'll never happen. Does he go into resignation? Well, uh, it doesn't even matter that much anyway. No, he says this. He talks about opportunity. He says, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And so here's where I just want to land this message today and speak it to all of you. Where there's a mess, in Jesus' name, there's an opportunity. And where there's a mess in our society, there's an opportunity for God to do something. And when there's a mess in your life that's going around you, broken relationships and family relations are just in shambles, there's an opportunity for God to work redemption. And when there's a mess inside of you and you feel broken beyond repair, there's an opportunity where God wants to bring healing and wholeness to your life. God wants to bless the mess. Amen? So, be very careful how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. And make the most of every opportunity. Because the days are evil. Here's the heart of this series. We've picked a character in the Bible for the next several weeks. Every week we're going to talk about a different character. And our criteria for them was one, that they had to first be in the Bible. Thank you for that. Two, that there had to be a mess. And three, that God used them to bless the mess. And we're going to learn that. And we're going to learn to be people who God blesses the messes of our world and of our lives. And God's going to do it through us in Jesus' name. Now, the band's going to come out here in just a moment. We're going to sing a song called Tremble. It's a great song. We're singing about how Jesus makes the darkness tremble, how Jesus makes the messes tremble. He doesn't tremble. The messes tremble. But before we do that, and before we sing in response to this, um, I want to ask a question. I would be a bad pastor if I came in here stirring up all this stuff about all the pain and struggle in society and in our lives and talking about your lives, but not praying for you. 
And so I invite you now, would every head bow, every eye close, just for to give privacy as much as possible to the people around us. If you came in here today and your life is a mess and you are in despair or even resignation, but man, you want living hope and you need God's help, would you raise your hand so I can pray for you? Okay. Father, I pray now in the name of Jesus for every hand that was raised and for those online who might be struggling too. And Lord, even for the ones who didn't raise their hand but were afraid to, here's what I ask. We take authority over the spirit of despair in the name of Jesus. And we say, you've got to go. Jesus, break chains, make darkness tremble, and breathe hope. I just speak over every person who's struggling with resignation or despair in this room. I speak over you now in the name of Jesus. God's not done yet. God's not done yet. He's not done yet. Lord, cause hope to rise and darkness tremble. Break despair. Make us people of hope. And make us people who you can use to bless the mess. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said...